as we see more and more headlines about a cashless society, the next global pandemic, civil unrest, and rumors of war, as we see or rather hear how perverted some worldly music is becoming and we see the slipping standards of morality in this world, as we see and hear all that is going on, I would like to share a few messages regarding the last days from some of the preachers who have made an impact on my life. I pray this will refocus your mind on God and encourage you to meditate on the Word of God. At the end of his sermon, as he was conducting an altar call and urging people to repent and turn to Christ, Derek Prince once said the following, Dear friends, we are living in the midst of a perverse and a crooked and an immoral and a dishonest and an untrustworthy generation. You need to be saved from it. You need to come out from it. You need to be changed. You need to be different. I know people have come forward already this morning. Thank God for everyone that did. But if there is anyone here this morning, you've never turned your back on this godless world and this ungodly generation You've never come out and made a commitment to Jesus. I want to give you one final opportunity to do it. Don't be caught in the devil's snare. Save yourselves from this perverse generation. I know that there are those who need to do that. We are not going to wait. This may be your last opportunity. You want to escape the wrath of God. The judgments that are falling on a Christ-rejecting nation. Now, one of my all-time favorite preachers was a man named Adrian Rogers. Concerning the last days, here's a powerful quote that he said. The late great Dr. Vance Havner used to say that civilization is like a chimpanzee with a blowtorch in a room full of dynamite. That's the situation we're in. So scientifically, we're in the graduate school. Morally, we're in the kindergarten. Science is not the answer. I want to say that politics is not the answer. No politician is going to be able to deliver us. We win the wars and lose the peace. The only thing that social reform does, if it prevails at all, is to make the world a better place to go to hell from. And it's not going to save this world. You know, sometimes people say, well, you preachers, you're pessimists because you don't believe that we can change the world. I'm not a pessimist. I'm a glowing optimist because I know the only one who can. Friend, I am waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come again. The answer to this world's problems, believe me, beyond a shadow of any doubt or peradventure is the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He is coming visibly. He's coming victoriously. Dr. Tony Evans gave this brilliant illustration which should help us to live with our eyes on eternity. He said, Any NFL player will tell you that during the season, Monday is Judgment Day because that's the day where the tape is revealed from Sunday's game. And you go in with your position coach and the position coach analyzes the tape from your position to tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly of your performance on the previous day, on Sunday. Many will tell you that they weren't excited about that day. If they knew they hadn't performed well the day before, and the tape would reveal that. There's coming a day when you and I will be with the Lord and He is going to show you your tape. This will be the tape from the time when you accepted Christ to the time of your transition to glory, either by death or by the rapture. It will be a review of your life as a Christian. It's not a review to determine salvation. You don't even get to this judgment unless you're a Christian. It is an examination to determine the gain or loss of reward. That is, how did you function as a Christian? Over and over again, the Apostle Paul in particular, but other New Testament writers, talked about this day. 
because he wanted to inform Christians not only to understand the day, but to begin to orchestrate our lives in light of that day. Jensen Franklin once said, David says, I realize I could be here in one moment and gone the next. This is a profound thought. It's something that we should always be aware of, that you're one step away from death, that you could be here alive and well this morning, and one step away you could be gone, and you will stand before the Lord. One out of one dies. The only way that you can get to heaven is through death. Are you ready? Are you ready to face God? All men die. Hebrews 9 verse 27. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after death, the judgment. You're going to answer to God for the life that you live. If you died today, where would you spend eternity? There's no other name whereby we can be saved but the name of Jesus Christ. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No other way. No other truth. No other life. Everything else is a deception and a lie. Jesus is the way. There's another life beyond this life. There's another place beyond this earth, and it is more glorious and splendid than anything we can even imagine. As we navigate a world filled with distractions, temptations, and deception, the Bible calls us to protect the wellspring of our faith, the heart. Let's look at four illustrations. The first is a castle's mighty walls. Imagine a grand castle with towering walls guarding against invaders. Just as these walls shield the precious treasures within, our hearts must be fortified against the enemy's attacks. Proverbs 4 verse 23 counsels, Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. Like diligent gatekeepers, we must protect our hearts from the infiltration of doubt, falsehood, and sinful desires. Now let's look at the watchful shepherd. Imagining a vigilant shepherd tending to his flock, he scans the horizon, protecting his sheep from lurking predators. Similarly, God watches over us, calling us to be faithful over the condition of our hearts. In 1 Peter 5 verse 8, we're reminded, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Just as the shepherd's watchful eyes safeguard the sheep, our spiritual discernment guards our hearts from the enemy's schemes. Thirdly, we have to look at the garden's tender care. Think of a well-tended garden where diligent care yields bountiful fruit. Our hearts are like gardens requiring careful cultivation. In Galatians 5 verse 22 to 23, we learn about the fruits of the Spirit as the Bible tells us that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nurturing these qualities guards our hearts against the weeds of bitterness, anger, and impurity. And finally, the filtering lens. Consider a camera with a special lens that filters out unwanted light, allowing only the desired image to be captured. Likewise, your hearts need a filtering lens that sieves out harmful influences. Philippians 4 verse 8 guides us saying, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, 
whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. This lens of discernment guards our hearts against the corrosive impact of negativity and impurity. You see, the importance of guarding our hearts in the last days cannot be overstated. Just as the castle's mighty walls, the watchful shepherd, the garden's tender care, and the filtering lens offer vivid illustrations, so does the Word of God guide us toward a heart guarded against deception. May we be diligent stewards of our hearts, recognizing that they are the wellspring of our faith and the sanctuary of the Holy Spirit. Let us heed of Proverbs 4 verse 23 and commit to safeguarding our hearts with unwavering dedication. As we navigate a world marked by uncertainty, temptation, and deception, let the love of Christ be our impregnable fortress. With hearts guarded in Christ, we can shine as beacons of truth, hope, and purity amidst the darkness, upholding the timeless truths of our Lord's promise. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Have you ever read Daniel chapter 12? It's one of those chapters whereby, if you ever need a reminder of what's to come, you have to read Daniel chapter 12. If you ever need a reason to be more focused and determined to live right, well, read Daniel 12, and it's a, it's a chapter that will give you plenty reason to focus on things above and not on the things of the earth. The Amplified Translation paints a more vivid picture of this revelation in Daniel 12 because the Bible says from verse 1 to verse 3, Now at that end time Michael, the great angelic prince who stands guard over the children of your people will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. But at that time, your people, everyone who is found written in the book of life will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake resurrect, these too everlasting life, but some to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who are spiritually wise will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven, and those who lead many to righteousness will shine like the stars forever and ever. My main prayer request to the Lord is not that my name should be found written in the book of life. It's obviously something I want, but it's not my main prayer point. My main prayer point is not even that I should escape the distresses which verse 1 describes as having never occurred since there was a nation until that time. You see, my main prayer point is, Lord, help me. Keep me alert. Open my eyes and ears so that I do not miss the signs you are giving us as your children. And here's why it's my main point. You see, the Bible says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. What a shame! What a disaster it would be for any believer to miss this sign. We've been told here that in the last days, God will pour. He will release a steady flow of His Spirit on all flesh. But what a shame it would be for any believer to miss this sign. What a shame it would be to miss out on the outpouring of God's wonderful Spirit. That's why my main prayer point is, Lord, 
Don't let me miss out on you pouring out your spirit. Don't let me miss out on this wonderful sign. We all know that we're given many different signs about what will happen in the last days, how people will act, how people will be unfaithful, how there will be a nation rising against nation. But those are not the signs I want to focus on. I do not want to miss the sign of God pouring out his spirit in the last days. I instead want to be a recipient. I want to be a partaker. I want the Holy Spirit to flood my life. So what is it that you are focused on in the last days? Because if you're not praying and watching, then that day of the Lord will sneak up on you like a thief in the night. Is it not a scary thought that there are those among us who say the name of Jesus. They stand in praise and worship and sing the name of Jesus. They stand behind the pulpit and preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. They have the hat, t-shirt, and shoes to match. And I mean on the outside, they look like disciples. But on the inside, their hearts are far away from the Lord. Isn't it a scary thought that Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23 says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So you see, there are people who will look like they are in the church. They will look like they love the Lord. But looks is as far as it goes. There is no substance to them. No real conviction to repent and live their lives for God. So my message to you is that you should make sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Don't be caught up on whether you look good or holy to other people. Instead, be caught up in really living for God. Take note of the events happening in and around this world. Take note of the strange things happening, but keep your focus on developing a deep, meaningful, and intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. The focus for our lives should be to make sure that our individual relationships with God are in good standing. Saints, the Bible says in 2 Timothy 3 that in the last days, perilous times will come. The world will be unthankful, unholy, lovers of pleasures rather than lovers of God, among so many other things. Now, whether these are the last days or not, whether this is the 11th hour or not, you and I as believers need to make sure that we have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We can only enter the kingdom of heaven through the one who is the way, the truth, and the life and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus who explicitly said, no one comes to the Father except through me. You and I need to make sure that we are not found to be the ones who the Bible states. Many will say, Lord, Lord, I have done many wonders in your name, but God will say, I never knew you, depart from me. Don't be in that group of people who are told to depart from the presence of God. Seek him today while there is still time. So rather than look at each and everything happening in the world and focusing your time and energy with a checklist, focus your time and energy on seeking God. That should be our only focus. To know Jesus, to seek his face, to meditate on his word, to have a right relationship with the Lord. Aim to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Because if you don't, then the words depart from me will be an eternal sentence to the darkness of hell.